Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon as we have been for 23 years uh, taking your calls. That's what we do for an hour a day. If you have questions about the Bible, we entertain those questions here if you want to bring them up. If you have a different viewpoint from the host, well, we'll talk about that here too if you'd like. Yeah, you only have to call. Now, one problem is if you call right now, you'll find the lines are busy. Our lines are full, but let me give you the number anyway, because there are plenty of opportunities during the program where lines will open up, and if you catch them at the right time, you'll get through. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Uh, now, I've been making some uh, uh, announcements the last few weeks about uh, Santa Cruz, California. We used to be on the air uh, in a station that reached Santa Cruz. It was actually a Salinas station. In fact, that was one of the earliest stations we were ever on. And it was the second station we were on uh, 23 years ago, 22 years ago, I guess. And, uh, and we aren't on there anymore. But we had a lot of, a lot of listeners, and I used to live in Santa Cruz, so we... But we know a lot of people there, and I don't know how many may still listen to the program by using the app or online, but we're not on the station there anymore. So I, 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 there may be a limited uh, number of people hearing this, but I'll be in Santa Cruz this Saturday speaking in a home in the evening. Uh, it'll be a Q&A. And then uh, I just discovered today I'll also be speaking in a church in Watsonville Sunday morning. That church is called Green Valley Christian Center. And the pastor has graciously asked if I would speak while I'm in the area on Sunday morning. So that's 10 o'clock in the morning at Green Valley Christian Center. I don't think we have that information posted at the website yet, but it will be by the end of the day. And uh, anyone who's in Watsonville may easily look up or, or near Watsonville. Uh, you know, Moss Landing, um, even Salinas could come up. Santa Cruz could come down. Lots of lots of people can come down or, or up to Watsonville. It's kind of central to several populated areas. So um, that's this Sunday morning. So we've got a Saturday night and a Sunday morning in uh, in, in the central coast. So uh, the information about the Santa Cruz meeting is already posted on our website. The meeting about Sunday morning will be posted. I just sealed it up a you know, 20 minutes ago or something. And that's where we settled it. So I'll be there, um, Lord willing. And you can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, and look under the tab that says announcements, and that's where you'll find time and place of meetings such as this. Okay, let's talk to, um, it looks like Gary in Ohio has been there the longest. Hi, Gary. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, hi Steve. Uh, my question will take about 90 seconds. I have a question about a blog article called James Teaches the Law and Not Grace. I would like to read a couple excerpts from it. You know, James 2.24 says, justified by works, not by faith only. And then the article goes on to say, uh, the most popular path toward reconciling passages like these is to let James' teaching inform and expand upon Paul's teaching. This path adds to works, works to grace, and as Paul so it's very clearly Romans. If you add any works to it, then grace is no longer grace. And then a little bit further down, it goes on to say, when Paul went to Jerusalem to straighten out the disagreement about the Gentiles keeping the law, Acts 15, it was James who made the final verdict about whether the Gentiles had to keep the law of Moses. While James and the other apostles agreed the Gentiles did not have to keep the law, that agreement did, did not include uh, the believing Jews. They were still expected to keep the law just as Jesus commanded. And then to kind of conclude this, some of the portions I'm reading from this, it says, uh, So if James continued throughout his whole life to teach the necessity of keeping the law of Moses to Jewish believers, then shouldn't we follow his teaching? We'd only do so if we missed one of the biggest plot twists in the entire Bible, in which God appoints a man named Paul to offer a righteousness that is apart from the law to a new group of people, the Gentiles. So, Steve, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, is that person saying that Jews are saved one way in our time and Gentiles are saved another way? Is that the suggestion of the blogger? Well, I think this person comes from that view that 
you know, Jesus came, you know, hyper dispensationalist or whatever from that viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Well, let me let me respond to that then. First of all, he certainly misrepresents Paul when when he said that Paul tells us in Romans that if you add any works that it's no longer of grace. Paul didn't say that at all. Paul said that if justification is by works, then it's not by grace. It's a very different thing. You see, great works might be added to your life for reasons other than seeking to be justified by them. And this is where Paul, uh, you know, often is misunderstood because, first of all, Paul is talking in Romans 4, which is, I'm sure, where he's referring to. Uh, he's talking about, you know, the fact that we are not under the law of Moses, that is, under the uh, the special laws that were given by Moses to Israel. Of course, we're under moral law. All, all societies at all times are under moral law. Even before the law of Moses came, it was wrong to murder and commit adultery and steal. Those are universal moral standards. They happen to be mentioned in the law as well, but they didn't. They weren't created by the law. They, you know, the law identified them, but they were already known. What was special about the law was circumcision and Sabbath keeping and festivals and the, and the special diet that God required of the Jews. Now, those are the laws that Paul is addressing in Romans 4 because he's addressing the Jewish prejudice against the Gentiles. And they believed, as you can tell by reading the rest of chapter 4 of Romans, they believed that an uncircumcised man was not acceptable. And Paul went on to talk about, well, uh, even a Gentile who's uncircumcised might uh, you know, follow the righteousness of the law and his uncircumcision would be counted as circumcision. So we're talking about circumcision. So is Galatians when Paul talked about the law there. When Paul talks about you know, works in a negative light, he's always in the context talking about works of ritual Jewish law. Now, on the other hand, Paul speaks a great deal about works in a positive light, just like James does. James says faith without works is dead. Well, Paul certainly agreed with that. If you read you know, Galatians 5, 6, Paul said, For in Christ Jesus neither, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith that works through love. Okay, so he says, it doesn't do you any good to get circumcised. There's the Jewish laws of no value to you. But works of love are certainly uh, required. He says, what matters to God is a faith that works through love. Well, what about a faith that doesn't work through love? Well, Paul has no, nothing good to say about that, and neither does James. James says the demons believe and tremble. Well, they have faith, but they don't have one that works through love. And when, when Paul says that what, God, what matters to God is that you have a faith that works through, through love, that is, it's a faith that produces good conduct. If you don't have good conduct, you haven't been regenerated. And therefore, you don't have the faith that saves. A good a regeneration results in having a heart of stone taken out of you and a heart of flesh putting in you, put in you, uh, according to the imagery of Ezekiel 36. Or in Jeremiah 31, having law, God's law written in your heart. That means you, you're changed internally. You have the Holy Spirit within you, convicting you and directing you and producing the fruit of the Spirit. That, that, that means your life is characterized by good conduct, which is what Paul means by works when he's speaking of it in a positive sense. And that's what James is talking about. James is talking about works of love. There's no question about that. James never taught that keeping the law of Moses was required of anyone. He says in James chapter 2, verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Okay? So what, what does it require to do well? What kind of works is it that James is saying are important? Well, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's fulfilling, he said, the royal law. Now, it's not fulfilling the law of Moses, although the statement, love your neighbor as you love yourself, is one of the laws in, in the law of Moses. Uh, it is the law that Jesus taught. He's, it's a royal law because he's the king. And if we're in his kingdom, we are subject to his royal commands. What is his royal command? According to John uh, 13, 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. So Jesus gave a command. That's the same thing as a law. Jesus gave the command to love one another. Just, of course, that was also in the Old Testament, but that's not the same thing as saying that, uh, that Jesus was teaching the Old Testament or that James is. He's saying that loving one another is the royal law. That's the law that Jesus gave. And uh, did Paul believe that? Absolutely. If you read Galatians 5, he says, whoever has loved his brother has fulfilled the law. 
Okay. In Romans 13, he says the same thing. Uh, all the law, every commandment, whether it's love your, whether it's you don't murder, don't kill, don't commit adultery, uh, and any other law that's required, any other commandment, he said, if there is one, is fulfilled in this. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. So James and Paul both said that we must love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And of course we have to do that because that's what Jesus commanded. He's the king. He's the Lord. If you don't follow the Lord, you're not a, not a follower of the king, not a Christian. So Christians are, of course, required to have a faith, as Paul puts it, that works through love. And James fully agrees. There's, there's not a dime's worth of difference between uh, Paul's teaching and James's. Of course, James does talk about, you, do, you, do you not see that Abraham was uh, justified by works? Well, he was justified by faith, but that faith was not a faith without works. He said he was justified by uh, works and not by faith alone. That is to say, the faith that Abraham had was not alone. It was accompanied by works. Now, that doesn't mean he was uh, you know, saved by works, uh, as far as we know, no one can be saved by works. Paul seems to agree with that. But it does mean that a person is saved by faith if it is a faith that has works. With a faith without works, James said, is a dead faith. You can't get saved by that. And Paul seemed to agree completely. As far as good works go, it's amazing how hyper-dispensationalists try to make Paul somehow the enemy of good works. I've actually, growing up, I heard dispensationalists say, if you try to do good works, it's, a, it's an, an insult to God. Because you're, you're insulting grace. No, that's not true. What did Paul say about this in Titus chapter 1? He says about certain people he uh, disapproves of. In Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Okay, so Paul says you should be doing good works, and if you say you love God but you, but you don't, your works are denying God. If you look further in Titus chapter 2, Verse, uh, oh, let's see, where do I want to get it? How about verse 14? It says that Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So Jesus died so he'd have a people who are zealous for good works. If we're not zealous for good works, we're not that people that he died for. He died to acquire for himself a people who are zealous for good works. Uh, frankly, it says in Titus 3, 1, remind them, meaning the Christians, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Okay, so good works is something that sounds like Paul wants Christians to be involved in. So um, it, it says in Titus three fourteen, this is all in one book, but Paul says similar things in other books. Titus three fourteen, he says, let our people also learn to maintain good works. Okay, so... <laughs> Paul believed that the genuine Christian faith that saves is a faith that works through love. He made it very clear, as J and James believed that too, he, both of them made it very clear that the, the works are to be uh, in obedience to the royal command, you shall love your neighbors yourself. Paul said so in Galatians. Uh, he said so in Romans. Uh, he said so, uh, well, uh, James said so. Uh, Jesus said so. So, I mean, which part of the Bible are we going to use to, to make, make this not required? You know, every author of the Bible right. is, favors it. And the majority of what Paul wrote, as well as the majority of what Peter and James uh, wrote, uh, is about behavior. Paul even said, if someone wants to say he's against good works, he said in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10, that those who are unrighteous, meaning in their conduct, Will not, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He said the same thing in Galatians, or kingdom of God. He said the same thing in Galatians 5. Um, that you know, He lists all these works of the flesh, which are bad works. And he says, those who do these things will not, not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he didn't say those who have done these things but have now uh, been justified by faith, but if they're still doing them, uh, they'll be saved. No, if you're doing these things, that is, if that's your lifestyle, then you don't have the faith that Paul said is going to save someone. What matters to God is a faith that works. If your faith doesn't work, it doesn't work in saving you. What do you want your faith to do for you? You want it to save you? Well, if it doesn't work, it's not going to work. Uh, as I like to say, and I think I, I probably first heard this from A.W. Tozer, he said, any faith that makes no difference in your life doesn't make any difference to God either. And that's very reasonable. If it doesn't make a difference to you, yep. why should it make a difference to him? Right. 
Right. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. Great answer. I appreciate your time. Have a, have a great day. Okay, Gary. Thanks for your call. Good talking to you. Uh, Piaggio in Quebec, Canada. Hey, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, thank you, Steve. I just wanted to say that it's, uh, it's a brother of mine from Syracuse that referred me to you, and oh. it's maybe been like four or five months, and I've been really, really blessed with your ministry, so God bless you. Thank you for saying so. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about prophets in the New Covenant. Um, we were talking about, in a Bible study, about gifts of the Spirit and the fivefold ministry and prophecy in the New Covenant as one of the gifts. And um, my question is, are prophets still uh, being, uh, what's the word I could use? Are there still prophets now so, in the New Covenant, now that Jesus has come? Okay. Um, well, the coming of Jesus did not end the prophetic ministry. In fact, after Jesus had gone back to heaven, um, uh, you know, we have Agabus, the prophet, prophesying yeah. in the book of Acts. We have uh, Silas in the book of Acts is referred to as a prophet. We don't have any examples of his prophesying, but he's described as a prophet. So we know there are prophets in the church even after Jesus left. In fact, the Corinthian church had apparently a lot of them because Paul said, well, let only two or three of the prophets speak per service and, uh, and let the others judge. But he says, you may all prophesy. Uh, that the you know that the uh, church may receive edification. Uh, now, what's interesting is he said you may all prophesy. Apparently, uh, yet in in two chapters earlier, Paul said, "Are all apostles? Are all prophets?" Implying a negative. Not everyone is an apostle. Not everyone is a prophet. But he said you may all prophesy. Well, how do we how do we harmonize those two things? Well. I believe all the gifts of the Spirit are still with us. That is, you know, you read the list of gifts that Paul gave in 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12. Uh, and I believe that those gifts are with us until the end of the church age. At, at least that's what Paul seemed to say in 1 Corinthians 1.7. where he said to the church, you will come behind in no gift awaiting the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the church is to be with the gifts and have them until Jesus comes back. That's a rather plain statement of Paul. But, uh, and also he said in 1 Corinthians 13 that these gifts are with us until we all uh, no longer know in part or prophesy in part, but, you know, when we know as also we are known, when that which is perfect has come. So that's future. We're not there yet. So I believe all the gifts, including prophecy, are in the church and that, like Paul said, you may all prophesy, but he indicated not all are prophets. And so, well, how can it be that if I could prophesy, I, I would not necessarily be a prophet. Well, it's sort of like, uh, frankly, I'm not a prophet. And honestly, I've never prophesied. Even since I got filled with the Spirit 50 years ago, I've, I've never prophesied knowingly. But I'm a teacher, and that's another, that's another gift of the Spirit the Bible mentions. And it's also another office. He said he gave first apostles, second early prophets, third teachers. Now, pr apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, these are what we might call offices uh, that uh, you know that Christ gave to the church, certain gifted men in their leadership with these offices, but gifts in general, I think, simply refer to God giving supernaturally by His Spirit the ability to do something that He's called you to do. Um, now, uh, I, I believe that if God willed it, I could prophesy. I, I, I haven't, and I don't. Uh, I'm not particularly seeking to, and maybe in that I'm disobedient because Paul said, seek the best gifts, especially that you may prophesy. When I was younger, I used to yeah. kind of pray that I used to pray that I would prophesy, but it didn't seem to be what God uh, did through me. Instead, you know, I'm a teacher and, and there's a distinction made between prophets and teachers. But what I'm saying is that even a person who's not a teacher, that is, doesn't hold such an office, could still teach. I mean, everyone should teach their children. Uh, Paul said the older women should teach the younger women. Um, we, we are to teach the nations, uh, you know, to make disciples, teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus commanded. Everybody can teach. In Hebrews chapter 5, it says, for the time you ought to be teachers. You still need to be taught all the simple things yourself. So every Christian should be in a position to teach, just like every Christian should be in the position to uh, evangelize. But not everyone's an evangelist and not everyone's a teacher. It, it, you know, these are things that some people may do occasionally, but that doesn't that doesn't define them 
as a role of a teacher or an evangelist in the, in the body of Christ. Likewise, uh, God may speak prophetically through somebody without them thereby holding the office of a prophet. What would be the difference? Well, I think that uh, the difference is whether we're thinking about evangelism or teaching or prophesying, any of us might do any of those three things if God wishes for us to and at such a time as he wants us to. But that doesn't mean we're all either prophets or evangelists or teachers, but uh, that there are some who are. And those who are, no doubt, are the ones that God has set apart to do those things primarily. That's what they mostly do is prophesy or evangelize or teach. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be all they do, perhaps, maybe the only contribution they make to the body. So... Your question, are there still prophets? I have to say, on one hand, I do believe there's still prophecy. I still believe all the gifts of the Spirit are available to the church. I believe prophecy because I, I see prophecy in the Bible. Like, we, sure. it tells us to seek for prophecy. And, but it seems to me that prophecy is different in the way that it's spoken in the New Testament, where it's something we speak on to people for edification, for comfort. Well, it is. Not necessarily, like, to tell the future, you know? Well, but Agabus told the future. Agabus was a prophet who told the future mm -hmm. in the early church. So, yeah. I mean, it, it can still involve that. I don't know that I've ever heard any modern person prophesy and accurately tell the future. I've heard people predict mm -hmm. earthquakes that never happened, uh, election results that never happened, <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, what, what gender a baby was going to be that didn't happen. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard uh, people tell me that God's uh, putting somebody together with someone else uh, in marriage and it didn't happen. So, I mean, uh, you know, when people actually predict the future, uh, I, I haven't found most of the people that I've heard do that to have a, a very good track record. But that doesn't mean it mm -hmm. can never happen because Agabus did uh, predict the future. Paul did. Of course, he was an apostle, not a prophet. But the point is that, uh, you know, I, I believe prophecy exists in the church, and I believe all the gifts do, but that doesn't mean that all the offices have to still exist the same. A lot of people think the fivefold mm -hmm. ministry has got to be with this until the end. But, you know, Paul said in the same book, where he mentioned apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In the same book, he said, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Well, the church is a building that's been under construction for 2,000 years. The foundation is the first thing you lay in a building. And everyone else who comes along after it should be building on that foundation. You don't come and lay another foundation every generation. The church has one foundation, and, uh, which is Christ, and that's, that's put there by the apostles and prophets in the first century. I don't know if we have today people who hold the office of apostle and prophet since they are described as the foundation of the church. But we still have certainly evangelists and pastors and teachers who mm -hmm. build on that foundation. I don't know that we need more foundation laid, so I don't know if we need the offices of, Paul, uh, of apostle and prophet. I'm not saying there are no apostles and prophets. I will say that I've been in charismatic, spirit-filled circles for over for 50 years now. 1970 is when I first got baptized in the Spirit, and I've been uh, among charismatics uh, that whole time since then. That's 50 years. I also teach for Youth with a Mission all around the world, which is a charismatic organization. And so I've been in every continent. I've been, you know... I've heard people claim to be prophets. I've heard people claim to be apostles. And all I can say is, if there are apostles and prophets today, I, I really haven't run across them. And that's a surprising thing, because you'd think they'd be fairly prominent. I mean, a, an apostle mm -hmm. or a prophet would be a very prominent thing. I, what I've found is people who claim to be apostles and claim to be prophets, but when you test them, uh, they don't really turn out to have those qualifications. You know, Jesus commended in, if, in Revelation 2, the church of Ephesus, because they tested those who said they were apostles and found them to be liars and rejected them. So uh, Jesus and, and Paul said there'd be false prophets, uh, there's false apostles. But as far as true apostles and prophets today, I don't really know that I could point to one. I don't know if I could name one. And, and in a half a century, traveling the whole world and, and teaching in charismatic circles, it seems strange to me if they really are around. I, I think that's why I ask, because yeah. I've never encountered it. And, um, you know, I've never seen, you know, okay, people can get it right once in a while, but I've never seen it. I've never heard of it. And yeah. uh, even well, if I look I found... at Matthew 17... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead and finish it, it, when I see in Matthew 17, you know, on the transfiguration where there's Moses and Elijah, yeah. and then they're gone, and God literally says, well, now listen to my son. Right, right. exactly, uh, exactly. But, but you I see, we like, listen to well, his now son. Now we have everything. Yeah, well, we do listen to his son, but his son may speak through 
gifts of the Spirit, too. I mean, mm-hmm. if, if the Holy Spirit gives a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or a prophecy or, or, or a, a, a teacher who's gifted to teach, you know, the Son himself is the one we hopefully are hearing from. So listening to his Son, you have to realize that in the early church, in fact, frankly, up until the 16th century, the average Christian didn't have access to a Bible. I mean, we do now. Mm-hmm. And that's, a, that's probably the most wonderful source we have for hearing what Jesus had to say, since we have his actual words recorded. But uh, the early Christians prior to the invention of the printing press mostly didn't have Bibles available. And um, so, I mean, to suggest that the Bible is the only way we could hear from him would be saying that for three quarters of church history, Christians had no way of hearing from the Son. And yet Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and know my voice and follow me. Hey, I need to take a break, but I hope that's been helpful to you, brother. I I do appreciate you calling. Uh, We have another half hour coming up, but we need to take a break briefly here to let you know that The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry. If you uh, would like to help us down the air, you can write to us at this address. It's The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California. 92593. Uh, you can also go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. That place is loaded with resources and nothing will cost you a penny there. It's all free, but you can donate if you wish at thenarrowpath.com. I'll be back in 30 seconds, so don't go away. As you know, the Narrow Path Radio Show is Bible radio that has nothing to sell you but everything to give you. So do the right thing and share what you know with your family and friends. Tell them to tune in to the Narrow Path on this radio station or go to thenarrowpath.com where they will find topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all the radio shows. You know listeners supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Share what you know. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or Christianity, we'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, If you have a different viewpoint from the host, we'd be glad to hear from you also. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Again, for those who didn't catch the announcement uh, about a half hour ago, uh, this weekend I'm going to be speaking at a couple of places on the central coast of California. One is uh, Santa Cruz. I'll be speaking there this Saturday night. And the other is, Mon- uh, is excuse me, Watsonville. Uh, I'll be speaking there Sunday morning uh, at, the, uh, at a, a church that just asked me to come just, but just before the program. So it's the Green Valley Christian Center, 10 in the morning in Watsonville, Sunday morning. So... Uh, you can get information about that at our website, thenarrowpath.com. Going back to the phones, the lines are full at the moment. Let's talk to Clay in Sacramento, California. Hi, Clay. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Yeah, hi, Steve. I just had a, a quick question about salvation. Um, my question is, Is do we need to be water baptized to be saved? Well, we were commanded to be water baptized. So the one thing we can certainly say is we need to be water baptized in order to be obedient. Now, if we're only thinking about how little we can do in terms of obedience to God, how much we can have our own way uh, and still have a ticket to heaven, then I'm not sure we're saved anyway because we really haven't converted. Uh, If all I'm interested in is heaven, then all I'm interested in is me. And that's not being converted because when I was born thinking about me, I need to be born again so that my orientation is no longer I, but Christ. When I'm born again, I I do think about me, but it certainly is not the major concern. The major concern is, is God happy? You know, not am I happy, but is God happy? Uh Now, so if, if, if I'm saved... That means in my heart, I want God to be happy. I want to please him. I want to obey him. So when I hear right. that he has commanded me to be baptized, of course, I, I will do so. If I, it's not baptism that saves me. Uh, it's, it's conversion to Christ that saves me. And my faith uh, and justification and the coming of the Holy Spirit are what re- regenerate me and, and so forth. And once so I'm regenerated, I have a heart to obey God, so I will be baptized. 
so the baptism is, is like a complete conversion, would you well, say? Well, it's, it's a seal. It's like a seal of conversion. You know, I, okay. I've, I've often because likened I, it. I have, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just have uh, um, pastors that tell me it's not necessary to be um, baptized to be saved. Well, ig- ignore them because uh, it's irrelevant. I mean, if you can be saved without baptism, well, why do we need to know that? We're commanded to be baptized. In other words, okay. it's like saying, can I still be saved if I don't love my enemy? Well, why do I need to know that? I'm just trying to figure out how little I can get away with and still get me out of hell. I mean, that's not what conversion okay. is. Con- conversion is, I'm the follower of Jesus. He's my king. He's my Lord. I love him. I want him to be pleased. Does he want me to love my enemy? Then I want to love my enemy. Does he want me to be baptized? I do. I mean, if I told you that you don't have to uh, be baptized, or you don't have to do anything that Jesus commanded us to do to be saved, what I'm saying is don't worry about whether Jesus is happy or not. Just, you know, just do the least you need to do to get your own sorry butt out of hell. I mean, that's really what most evangelists are saying in many cases. So, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I don't agree with that. I, don't, I, I personally, I think if I'm converted, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's what, con- right. that's what conversion is. A follower of Jesus okay. and who obeys Jesus. So, no, I'm not saying by being baptized. That I can, is there a scripture that I can find in the Bible where it says, because uh, I remember you talking about we are commanded to be baptized because Jesus yep. told us to. Um, where, where would that be? Well, Jesus, when he gave the Great Commission in Matthew okay. 28, uh, uh, 19, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He made it very clear that he wants his disciples to be baptized and then and teaching okay. them to observe everything I've commanded you. So he doesn't want them only to be baptized, but to observe everything he's commanded. That's what we're supposed to teach people. So it's very clear. Perfect. He has expressed his will on that. When, when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, and the people said, what must we do? In Acts 2.38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the apostles speak for Christ, too. Whatever the apostles command is essentially a command of Christ being issued through his apostles. So the Christians are told, commanded, to baptize converts and to be baptized if they are a convert. Now, more than that, okay. um, as you go through the book of Acts, you see the importance of it. You know, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were converted and they all got baptized, apparently the same day, because say that day, 3,000 people, souls were added to the church. So they were mm-hmm. added by baptism. Now, again, okay. I don't believe that, I don't think baptism is what uh, justifies you. Because, I mean, the thief on the cross clearly was not baptized, and he, he was justified by the command, was the statement of Christ, today you'll be with me right. in paradise. But he also didn't do anything else Christ commanded him to do. He died within, you know, hours. Right, he didn't have a chance. Him. Yeah, I mean, there are people who love Christ and are committed to serve him, but, you know, the circumstances are simply, they simply don't allow them to do everything he wanted, to, uh, he wanted them to do, but they, they would want to. That's, that's the thing. We, I think we're, there's two ways to look at salvation. One is how little do I have to do to get to heaven? In which <laughs> I know. Case, it's too much of that stuff out there. I know. And in, in that case, <laughs> I'm only thinking about me, which means I don't have a new heart yet because that's my old heart. My old heart has always right. been just thinking about me. I've not been converted. Yeah. I'm still looking out for me just as much as I was before I heard about Jesus. It's just that now I've, I've recruited him to make my life better. That's not, and a lot of evangelists encourage that attitude, but the Bible doesn't anywhere. Yeah. And yeah. So, so the way the Bible can, has it is that Jesus is the king. He's the Lord. He commands all men everywhere to repent. It's not an invitation. It's a command. It's an ultimatum. All, all the world that is not submitted to Christ is AWOL, uh, is basically a deserter from the king of the universe. And the yeah. only way they can get in right relation with him is to repent of that. And, and mm-hmm. when we do repent and put our faith in Christ, that doesn't just mean we got amnesty with no, no strings attached. It means we got amnesty, amnesty and, <laughs> and, and, and now we're citizens again. Now we're under the king again. We, we had been yeah. di- we've been ditching our responsibility, but we repent of that. He grants amnesty on the understanding that now that you're back, now you're going to do what you were supposed to do in the first place, Right. I mean, right, right. so if someone flees America to Canada to avoid the draft uh, and they want amnesty, 
Well, the assumption is, I mean, that's, it's, I think it's, it's implied in the very thing. Well, if you are forgiven for being a deserter, that means you're not going to be a deserter anymore, right? You're going to be right. uh, a law-abiding citizen. So mm-hmm. salvation, although it's true that we're justified by faith, that's amnesty. But salvation isn't just amnesty. It's not just justification. It's also, it's also uh, regeneration. It's restoration. It's, um, it's transformation. It's sanctification. Eventually, it's glorification. That's all part of salvation. And, and yeah. when, our preacher, when our preachers only teach justification, they're teaching a truncated gospel, not, not a gospel that you find really preached by the apostles or uh, in the book of Acts. You don't find them preaching uh, a gospel strictly about justification. They preach about the kingship of Jesus. He's the Lord. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. That means he's... Yeah, the I've, been, you have I've, been listening, I've been listening to some of your lectures, and I'm really uh, um, starting to kind of understand that um, it's, it's the preaching of the kingdom. Of, right. of of of, the, of God that he preaches. He didn't preach about heaven so much and hell. And you have to. It's almost like today's preaching is they're trying to persuade you to get saved by fear. Right. And uh, but I I'm trying to understand more about that, and I'm I'm really yeah. understanding a lot more by listening to some of your lectures. So I really appreciate well, I, that. I want to make it plain that Jesus did speak about hell. And he did speak yeah. about e- eternal life, you know, uh, with him. But this was right. never the focus of much of his teaching. He, he actually talked to the disciples who were already, even his apostles, he talked about those things. But to the crowds, we never see him mentioning heaven or hell. That's not his message. When you read Peter's sermons and Paul's sermons and Acts, uh, they didn't ever mention heaven or hell because that's not the message. It's true. Heaven exists and hell exists, and, and that's significant, but it's not the message yeah. we have. The message we have is not right. how to get out of hell. The message we have is get right with God, and the only way you can do that is to submit to Jesus Christ as king, which is the thing you've been neglecting to do and why you're in trouble in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. All, All right. right. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate uh, your insight. I appreciate your call, Clay. God bless you. All right, let's uh, take another call. This one's been waiting a long time. Jason in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Thank you for waiting, and welcome to The Narrow Path. Uh, Hi, Steve. I was wondering about um, what is the minimum amount of evidence that we would need in order to um, reach the world as far as uh, proving that Jesus rose from the dead and that the Gospels are true? Uh, Because some people will simply say that uh, somebody made it up and it's a story. And um, uh, different people have different interpretations of what is reasonable. So how do we present the facts and say um, it's reasonable to believe this and, and, um, and know okay. that that's true? Okay. Well, suppose we were trying to determine uh, the truth of a historical event. And that's what Christianity declares, a historical event. You know, Christianity is not a religion. It's the, it's the declaration of a, a historical event. Namely, God came to earth. He lived and died for us. He rose from the dead and he uh, enthroned at, uh, in heaven. And he's the king and so forth. Now, did any of those things really happen? If they did, that's historical. If they didn't happen, it's mythical. So the real question is, how do you, how do you determine if a historical event happened? Well, there might be many ways, but that's exactly what courts of law uh, examine. You know, did, did this crime happen? Did this person do it? Uh, and so how would we, you know, what rules of evidence would we seek in a court of law to decide, for example, if uh, Jesus rose from the dead? Well, frankly, since it happened so long, if it happened at all, it happened so long ago, there's no living witnesses. But we do have records of people who were living witnesses. And those are, of course, uh, in the Gospels. And that's four independent witnesses uh, from men who either knew Jesus or at least knew and traveled with those who did uh, follow Jesus around. So they were either firsthand witnesses like Matthew or John, or they were secondhand who traveled with, with uh, you know, apostles uh, like Mark and Luke did. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good number of uh, witnesses. I mean, if you're trying to prove whether or not somebody committed a murder... If you had two witnesses, even even one in many cases would be counted enough, but you really should have two, the Bible says. Two witnesses is enough to establish it. We've got like four. So then you say, well, some people say that's not true. Okay, well, then let them bring their witnesses. What what happened instead? Generally speaking, if a, if a person who is not otherwise known to be a liar or a perjurer, if they bear witness to something that they saw, 
uh, we take their word for it unless there's something shady about their witness. You know, obviously, some people tell us that, that things happen and we realize that you know, this person's kind of a you know, you know, suspicious character. I don't really like him. So I'm, I'm not going to believe him very much. But in a court of law, uh, a witness that has been vetted and qualified and and is uh, is in no sense known to be a liar or a uh, con man, uh, their witness is generally taken at face value. Now, even if they're not known to be a con man, their witness might not be true, but the burden of proof then would rest on those who say they're not telling the truth. If I told you, you know, uh, uh, you know, on my birthday last year, I did such and such a thing, you'd probably just believe it without any question. Because, frankly, I wouldn't have any reason to lie. And, uh, and you've never caught me to lie. Because I don't lie. Uh, honest people don't lie. And so, you know, you, you probably just believe me. Now, the uh, same thing. Uh, no one's ever caught these men in a lie who testified it. There's no reason to believe they were liars. In fact, there's incredibly strong reason to believe they're telling the truth since they were willing to die for their testimony. And that's not the same thing as a Muslim who's willing to die for his beliefs or even a Christian martyr who's willing to die for his beliefs. A testimony is what you saw. I saw it. I'm testifying. See, Muslims can never say they saw Muhammad or the, even a modern Christian martyr can't say they saw Jesus risen from the dead. But, but the apostles could. They were, like, they were like witnesses in a court of law saying this happened. I was there. I saw it. And we've got these independent witnesses. Now, a person can always doubt whatever they want to doubt. I mean, you can't prove that Jesus rose from the dead to someone who doesn't want to believe it because you can't prove, you can't make anyone believe something they don't want to believe. If they don't want to believe in any miracles, well, then you won't be able to convince them. If they don't want to believe Jesus is, is king because they don't want to follow him, well, you're not, not going to be able to convince them. But to an honest person who's not uh, a bigot, like a, let's say a materialist is a bigot. They've just decided uh, you know, prior to investigation that miracles don't happen. Well, anyone who's decided something prior to investigation is clearly prejudiced and a bigot. So, I mean, some people are. There are some people, no matter what evidence you give, they've already decided this doesn't happen, so you can't prove it at all. But to an honest person who does care about evidence and who would look at the actual you know, quality of the testimony and the character of the people who gave it, uh, in a court of law, it's a slam dunk that Jesus w would be proven to rise from the dead. Now, the, the only alternative would be is that even if you had impeccable witnesses that said he did, if somebody else could come along who's equally an impeccable witness and say, nope, that didn't happen. I was there and it didn't happen. Or who said, no, that can't have happened because what I saw, I was you know, around and, and I saw something happen. That's just the opposite of that. Well, okay, then you've got a, a problem. But we don't have that problem. We don't have anyone bearing witness to Christ differently than the ones who, whose records we have. There's no one from the first century saying that didn't happen. There's people who didn't want to believe it happened, but there's no one bearing witness to saying, no, I, you know, I saw that tomb four days after he was dead and he was still in there. You know, there's no not even the that. Jewish, not even the Jewish rabbis, not even the Jewish rabbis did that or the Romans. And it's interesting because if they could have, they certainly would have. They, they found the Christian witness to be a real annoyance and they would very happily have brought forth all the witnesses in the world who would say, yeah, you know, if you think Jesus rose from the dead, just go check it out. The tomb's still there. He's still there. You know, I mean, if they knew where the body was, they would have produced it to silence the Christians. They didn't know where right. the body was. Now the Christians, I mean, other, knew, the Christians knew where than it the, was. Yeah, other yeah. than the body, didn't aren't there any Jewish writers who say um, the Gospels are wrong, Jesus' disciples are wrong? Isn't there any sort of writing that just says they're wrong, even if it's not specifically saying? Oh, sure, Jesus didn't? sure, sure. Every non-Christian says they're wrong. Every non-Christian does not believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and by and, and therefore they're saying the apostles were wrong. But the people who are saying it are not contemporaries. I mean, the, the Talmud even mentions that Jesus lived and that he did miraculous things, but they don't see him as miracles. They called it sorcery. Okay, so, but they do bear witness to him doing supernatural things. It's just they hate Jesus. Uh, they were involved What's in crucifying Talmud? Jesus. The Talmud, that's the Jewish uh, holy books. That's, that's the books that Orthodox Jews follow, is the Talmud. And... Uh, well, and, and it, you know, it says he was a sorcerer. It says he was a illegitimate child of a Roman uh, soldier and, and, and a Jewish girl. Uh, they say he was uh, rightfully crucified because of the, 
his sorcery and so forth. I mean, they, there's, there's, most people in the world are not Christians, and therefore they believe the apostles are wrong. The only thing is... But when did they write that? The Talmud, was, they... uh, the t- Talmud is a collection of things that the Jewish rabbis said over a period of several hundred years, but they were written, uh, the, uh, I think the Babylonian Talmud was written down in the second century. And uh, the uh, Jerusalem Talmud, I think, was in the 5th century, if I'm not mistaken. So Nothing they, in the 1st century? No, the Jews don't have any 1st century witnesses against Jesus. Um, they, I mean, they didn't like him. But, you know, uh, the book of Acts tells us of the Jewish reaction to the testimony of the apostles. And they even said, we, cannot, we can't prove these people wrong. We have to silence them. You know, that's, that was the approach of the official Jewish opposition. So, so there's no first century there's no first century Jewish writings at all. Well, if uh, Josephus Josephus wrote in the first century, and he didn't contradict the apostles, although he was not a Christian, he was a Jew. Uh, he wrote the you know the history of the Jews in general, which he called Antiquities, and he also wrote a history of the the Jewish War. Uh, called Wars of the Jews or the Jewish War. And he mentions Jesus, but he doesn't mention him necessarily as himself being a believer in Jesus. But what he says is that Jesus, um, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He says that his disciples continued to say that he lived on after his, that, or that he rose from the dead on the third day. Josephus says that, but Josephus doesn't put his seal of approval on it. He's just saying that's what the Christians say. But he never yeah, said, so with all, he, he with never all, said this other group of people say he didn't, you know. Right. So with all those Jewish rabbis' writings that, that they have, there's nothing from the first century that, that says the Christians are wrong? Right. Well, well, I mean, you refuting them? No, there's no first century witness refuting it. Um, but of course, we have to remember that very few works have survived from the first century. I mean, but, mm-hmm. but the ones that have certainly do not bear any testimony against uh, the testimony of the apostles. Now, I can just say this quite simply. All the testimony we have from people who were there and qualified to write anything about it agree that Jesus rose from the dead. Anyone 2,000 years later who says he didn't, well, why should I believe them? They weren't there. I'll, I'll, right. believe, the pe- I'll believe the people who were there and who it gave is- their lives for their testimony. They gave their lives for their testimony, so they really believed it. Isn't it a problem that none of the Gospels actually uh, say, this is me writing the Gospel, and this is the date, and then go on to have it be in first person, like an eyewitness testimony account would do? It's actually not a problem. It's, it's the false Gospels written in the second and third centuries, where the authors claim to be somebody, Thomas or Judas or uh, you know Mary. I mean, the false Gospels of the Gnostics written in the second and third gen- century, they all have the name of somebody important as their author. The real Gospels don't have the names of the authors because they didn't have to. The, the early church knew who wrote them because they received them from their hands. Uh, nobody ever received a gospel from Thomas uh, until the second or third century, and the people who received it knew that uh, you know, the real Thomas had been dead for a long time at that time. But so the you know the false gospels falsely claim to be uh, written by apostles. The real gospels they had enough credibility not to have to make any boasts about who wrote them. The the church received them from their hands. I mean, Matthew wrote a gospel, he gave it to somebody, and the somebodies are the people who kept it and passed on to the next generation, and they passed along with it the knowledge of who had written it. The fact that they didn't have to put their names on it, to me, is impressive, because unlike the false gospels in the second, third centuries, the first century gospels were written by people who didn't have to claim to be anybody. They were known to be who they were. Right, but we were talking about, you were talking about a court of law, and in a court of law, wouldn't you have to have, like, the name on a document and the date? Well, not if, not if there were people who knew who wrote it, and, it was, and there were no alternative theories about who wrote it. I mean, it was universally agreed in the, new ch- in the early church who wrote those things. Listen, I really should give some other people a chance. I'm off the air here in about five minutes, so I think I probably... We've, you and I have talked for about 11, almost 12 minutes, so I should give someone else a chance. But I do appreciate your call because I love to talk about these things. Feel free to call in the future, and we'll talk about such things again if you want. Let's talk to Dan before out of time. Dan from Signal Hill, California. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Hey, Steve. Thank you so much for taking my call. Mm-hmm. Real quick question. On uh, the, the 10th to the 11th centuries, you guys were talking about the 1st century. We'll skip up a few uh-huh. centuries. Sure. St. Anselm of Canterbury's take on the satisfaction model. I've been watching debates on it. The jury is kind of out. 
out on it for me. I was curious to get your take on the satisfaction model by St. Anselm. Well, St. Anselm is said to be the founder of that view. There's, there's about four, maybe even five alternative views of the atonement, uh, including the Christus Victor view and, uh, uh, you know, the, the moral influence view and uh, the ransom view. Uh, most of these views see the atonement or the death of Christ uh, as being effectual for different reasons. Uh, Anselm appears to be the first person whose writings we have uh, that taught the satisfaction theory, which is held by most of us Christians today, um, evangelicals anyway. But it doesn't seem to have any earlier witnesses, unless, of course, the Bible itself teaches it, then we have early witnesses. But as far as it being popular in the church, it was not, uh, we don't have rec record of it being a primary view. Um, the satisfaction theory, of course, is that because of our sin, uh, there's a penalty to be paid, and uh, we need to satisfy that, uh, that deficiency. We have to satisfy God's wrath. Uh, and therefore, Jesus died in our place to satisfy that dem demand, and that he did so by pretty much taking on us, or excuse me, on himself, our sins, uh, becoming sin for us, as it were, and, and dying like a sacrifice in our place. Now, I don't think anyone before Anselm spoke of it quite that way, but at the same time, I don't think there was ever a time when the Christians did not see Jesus as a sacrifice for sins. And, uh, you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And um, I think all, virtually all Christians have recognized the sacrificial system of the Old Testament as being a depiction of, of uh, and a foreshadowing of the death of Christ. Well, what was the sacrificial system? It was where a worshiper brought a lamb or a bull or a goat to the temple, laid and a hand was laid on the animal's head, which implied transferring the sins of the person to the animal. This was done, uh, this is specifically described in the rituals of the Day of Atonement, and I think it's the 16th chapter of Leviticus. Um, but uh, the idea was that it was putting the sins of the guilty onto the head of the innocent. And then the innocent animal would then be sacrificed. Now, the idea here is that the sin was, in a sense, transferred to the animal. And, and then it became the representative, uh, you know, the, the substitute, as it were for the sinner in its, in its dying, because the wages of sin is death, something had to die that the animal did. The shedding of the animal's blood was the atonement. Now, to my mind, I'd have a hard time ruling that out. When I hear other views of the uh, atonement, I don't necessarily rule them out either. Uh, you know, when someone says, well, Jesus uh, conquered Satan through his death, and that's the Christus Victor view, or that Christ, you know, was an example of perfect obedience for us when he died. Well, that's the moral influence view uh, or whatever, uh, that he was a ransom for us. Well, Jesus himself said he came to give his life a ransom for many, so we can't rule out the ransom idea. The point here is that ransom, uh, satisfaction, uh, victory, uh, moral influence, all these things can be true of, of, uh, of the atonement. I don't know why they're in competition with each other. To my mind, all of these things are true, and people always want to settle on one of them and throw the other ones out the window. Well, why? Uh, is it wrong for us to say that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, and at the same time, he's the Lamb of God, and at the same time, he's the Messiah, and at the same time, you know, he's, you know, whatever. I mean, all these different names for Christ doesn't mean we have to take one and throw out the others. Same thing, in my opinion, for our views of the atonement. I don't think we have to accept one and throw out the rest. But I do think that satisfaction is certainly one of the views that has some biblical merit based on the Old Testament sacrificial system. I'm out of time. I wish we could talk more, but you've been listening to The Narrow Path. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are uh, listener-supported. You can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com to find out how to support us or just to take what's there for free, thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll be on again tomorrow.